Good evening, everyone. How are you? Good evening. Good evening. I am Tamara G from the Michael Bazin Show. I was here earlier today, so for the folks who weren't here, uh, welcome back this evening. And a few months ago, the American Heart Association sent out the call to startup companies, teams, individuals, and nonprofit organizations to develop business models that will bring fresh ideas and innovative solutions to communities to remove barriers to health and well being. With close to 130 submissions from coast to coast, they have, yes, 130, let's give them a round of applause. They've actually found their top 10 finalists who have come from different parts of our country to bring innovation to solving some big problems in our urban centers. Tonight, we do invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy these powerful and amazing ideas built to empower communities nationwide. So we're going to get started. Tonight we have four amazing individuals who are sitting on the judges panel. Many of you have had the pleasure of actually meeting our first judge of the evening, Mr. Mark Moore. He is a passion, let's give him a round of applause. Mark brought his uh, fan club with him. He is a passionate philanthropist. He currently sits on the Innova Board of Trustees, the Kennedy Center's National Symphony Orchestra, the Apollo Theater, Mount Vernon Hospital Quality Board, Hopkins House Fund Board, and the John Leland Center for Theological Studies. The American Heart Association is proud to have his support and guidance. And actually, at this time, we would like to welcome Mark and his lovely wife, Brenda. I saw Brenda. For you all to come on to the stage, please, for just a minute. We like to do surprises here at the American Heart Association. Thank you. 
She's like, what is going on here? Yes. We have an announcement. I think I'm supposed to give you the mic. First of all, good evening, everyone. And, and thank you once again. Um, Brenda and I, um, we, how long have we been partnered with the American, about three years now? About three, three or four years now. And how we started this process was, um, as, as she mentioned, I am a stroke survivor, a two-time stroke survivor. Um, and with a lot of hard work and a lot of prayer, I've been afforded a full recovery. Um, and people ask us, why do we do this? And we do it because I want, I want to be the norm. I don't want to be the exception, right? I don't want people to look at me and say, Mark, what a wonderful recovery. Boy, I wish other people. I want everyone to recover like I have. Um, and I believe partnering with the American Heart Association and the Power to Serve gives us that opportunity. The fact that when Brent and I think about philanthropy, we think about philanthropy in regards to the three T's. We talk about it, it's your treasure, it's your time, and it's your talent. And we give all three. We give of our treasure, we give of our time, and we want to give of our talent because we want to make a difference. Um, we continue to make a difference, and one of the things that um, we're doing right now, we're in the process right now of having discussions with the American Heart Association to continue to improve the lives of, of Americans in this country. Uh, one of the things I am particularly concerned about, um, and I love Empower to Serve because Empower to Serve gave, gave us the ability um, to really put our money to what we think helped us in our recovery. It was a combination of wonderful medical care and a tremendous belief in faith. And I believe going to the faith-based communities makes a lot of sense. And as I said, I believe we've done a wonderful job in educating people on the prevention of strokes. Strokes are near and dear to my heart, obviously, uh, as, as a survivor. But the one thing I think we have to spend more time is on, on the recovery aspect of it. And one of the things we have engaged with the American Heart Association is trying to make improvements in the role of recovery and being advocates for those people who are out there recovering. We want everyone to recover just as I have, and we think it's very important when, when you don't recover, it becomes a strain on society. It really does. Um, and you can recover. Uh, I am living proof that it can be done. Uh, I had two strokes and major brain surgery. And I couldn't use this left hand. I couldn't walk, couldn't speak. But yet, here I, here I sit today. So it can't happen. <laughs> Thank you very much. So we, we are working we're in, in discussions with the American Heart Association right now to try to improve the lives of Americans in their recovery and trying to be advocates for people as we move forward. And I'm going to give my wife the opportunity to say a few words. Well, he 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 is um, also has been working very hard um, with his book, and we wanted to um, let you know that um, Mark wrote a book about faith and about um, how it helped to bring him through the recovery and rehabilitation um, with regard to um, his strokes. So we wanted to let you know that some some of the books are out. Um, front, and you can certainly grab a copy um, if they're still available there. Um, just, we just want you to have a copy, and hopefully you'll be able to share that um, experience that Mark had with others, and you can pass them along to people who might really need um, some opportunity to talk about how faith helps you to recover and to get over hurdles, and it doesn't have to be stroke. So we... Um, invite you to take a copy of A Stroke of Faith and enjoy it and give us feedback. Um, Mark is always available to talk to um, groups as well. He loves to go to um, stroke recovery groups and he does a lot of that. When he talks about giving his time, that's one of the things that he's passionate about. So um, if you have any feedback for him, please um, share it. We are those kind of people, so um, please let us know what you think. Thank you so much for being here. This is a dream come true, so we're grateful. Thank you. We're going to take our seat and move ahead with the storytelling competition, if we could. Please. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Our next judge for tonight's competition is Ryan Mundy. Ryan is the chief strategist at Tech Leap Ventures. It's an early stage investment vehicle that seeks to benefit from cultural shifts that impact the way we live, work, and play. He is also the CEO of 12 AM Holdings Company. 12 AM seeks to acquire and grow privately held businesses in the health and leisure, digital, and media sectors. He also is a graduate of the University of Michigan. Uh. <laughs> Coming from a University of Texas grad. Uh, Ryan is also an eight-year veteran of the NFL. Which team, Ryan? Well, you know, that's really not any of America's favorite teams, which would be, which would actually be only one team, the Dallas Cowboys, but, but you're okay in our book. We'll let you stay. Yes, Ryan, thank you for being a part of our judges panel tonight. Go Cowboys. The next judge is Vanessa Mason. Vanessa is co-founder of P2 Health Ventures. It's an early stage public health tech venture fund and also the CEO and founder at Riveted Partners. Vanessa loving the green. She has been recognized as 40 under 40 tech diversity Silicon Valley 2016 New Leaders Council, San Francisco fellow, 200 black women in tech, to follow on Twitter, and she's also a 2016 TED Med Research Scholar. So thank you very much, Vanessa. Did you go to a sorry school too, like Michigan, or where'd you go? Where'd you go to school? Oh, okay, all right. <laughs> they ain't got no football team, though. They ain't got no football team. <laughs> oh, we got some Yale grads here, is this it? Okay. Tell her Ryan they ain't got no football team though. <laughs> yeah, now we're <laughs> And the final judge this evening is Lawrence Griffith. Lawrence, where are you, Lawrence? There you are. Lawrence is the founder and CEO of Digital Factory Inc. At Digital Factory, Lawrence and his team have created patent-pending technology called microfencing, which is a geolocation technology that can be plugged into any brand mobile application to increase consumer engagement and path to purchase. So you'll know everything that I buy on my mobile phone. Okay. He's been featured in the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Black Enterprise, Bloomberg Business Week, NPR, Who's Who, and he's served as a speaker for numerous national and international technology and marketing conferences. So let's give a round of applause to our wonderful judges here. And here's how the process will work. Each finalist will start off with 100 points, and points are deducted according to their ability to deliver on the three criteria. The judges will have one minute to share their feedback with each finalist. And I will keep you to that one minute, especially Michigan people. Here are the competition rules and criteria. No pitching. As has been stated before, this is not a pitch competition. Here's the big difference. Pitching describes what you do and how you do it. Entrepreneurs are wired to pitch, and each team has gone through extensive training to help them discover what makes them unique and to connect with their stories. Storytelling describes who you are, why you do what you do. It's purpose-driven. The stories are meant to inspire, motivate, and educate. Yes, some will, or they may be emotional, because guess what? The work that has to be done in our urban communities is big, serious, and emotional. Number two, their story must be told within or at five minutes. Everyone meet the lovely Diana. Where are you, Diana? She'll be our timekeeper tonight, Diana. My Vanna Black right here, Diana. Or actually would be Vanna White, I guess, tonight. At the four minute start, she'll raise this lovely green card. So that's when they start, actually. They start right there, the green card. At one minute, she'll raise a yellow card. That's a warning, you got a minute. And then at 30 seconds, she'll raise the red card. And then at five minutes, I'll come back up here and get them off the stage. And last but not least, the storytellers themselves must be able to project clearly their purpose and their mission. We all can be experts in everything, but a story can help us connect with themes that are universally understood. 
Now, we do have some live voting. For those of you in the audience and around the country, you'll have a chance to weigh in as well. All of you can use your phones, your tablets, or computers to vote by visiting www.slido.com. That's S-L-I-D-O, slido.com. You put in the event code, empowered to serve, all one word, and you'll be taken to a screen where you can review the storytellers and vote. The online voting will be used to determine a winner in the event of a tie, or if two storytellers are extremely close in scores and the judges would like to get a sense of how all of you sitting out there and around the country are reacting. All right, now here's the fun part. I just did all the rules, so here's the fun part. We've got $60,000 in cash prizes that are available, and we are deeply grateful to the Mid-Atlantic affiliate for securing these dollars, and here's the deal. Yes, the Mid-Atlantic affiliate. The top three finalists will receive 50% of their winnings and the remaining after they've well proven what they can accomplish and what they want to accomplish in their chosen cities has been accomplished. So you'll get 50% then the other 50%. So while tonight is very happy, all of us, and after all the applause is over, that's when the real and deeply important work begins. So without any further ado, let's start the show. We're going to welcome our first finalist, and I'm going to try not to mess up her name. It is Nisha Sarves Warren with Ambience Data. Come on up, Nisha. Thank you. Looking all pretty and red. I like it, Nisha. Very nice. All right, here you go. Um, thank you. Oh, you have one. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Nisha Service Warren, and I'm the CEO and founder of Ambience Data. We're on a massive mission to map the world's environmental parameters, and we're bringing environmental data out of the dark ages. We do this by developing hardware devices that are small and portable that are able to detect air pollution in real time. This device is called a Blue Jay, and everyone is able to understand what they're sensing. What we're trying to do is reduce asthma attacks. That's the basis of our whole environmental objective. And what we want to do is see what causes air pollution to cause asthma attacks. So what we're doing is basically building a network of sensors that help understand the pollution impact to uh, health impacts on asthma. We have adopted the city of Detroit as our first case study city. And what we're trying to do is to bring the, the devices to every single household so we really understand how pollution in uh, different neighborhoods affect health correlations. I want to tell you a little story about a little boy named Isa. He's a six-year-old boy who loves to play in dirt out in the field, plays all day long in the park, and he's basically a giant pollen and dust magnet. The problem is, he, like every other child, loves to play in the dirt, but he has asthma. And that means we don't know what environment is going to trigger his attack. The air that you breathe that's safe for you and me might not be suitable for him. The key word is might. We don't know what is suitable and what is not. And a parent, that is a nightmare. Because when you're first diagnosed, you want to protect your little baby. You want to give them everything. And you want to figure out how to manage this. But you have no information to do this. Well, that little boy is my son, and this is my reality. And there are millions of moms and families all across America that are struggling with the same thing. Because unlike the food we eat or the water that we drink, air doesn't come in nice label packages that says, go play soccer today or baseball today and stay indoors tomorrow. We all know what that means, and I wanted to change that. So I have a background in hardware engineering. I'm an aerospace engineer with a big data nerd, and I loved figuring out why things work this way. And I looked and I looked and I looked and I couldn't find this information of how to basically protect my baby. How do I really do up a situation where I know my house is safe, where he's going out to play and basically not walking in a bubble? And so we developed this hardware product that are able to put in your house, in your uh, hospital, in your school, outdoors, and you basically understand that it's really bad today, but the exact numbers. And this number causes him to react, and this doesn't cause this little other boy to react. 
And so we're able to prevent asthma attacks uh, much more and help reduce hospital admissions, which is a key factor. And so what we end up doing is having this massive collection of information to reduce risks associated with it. Because when your little boy can't breathe, your whole world ends at that point. And we're trying to bring together a network of um, communities that care, from community workers to daycare facilities to schools, to be able to give them the information that they're able to do something with it. We have a passionate team of tech nerds and health enthusiasts are working on this uh, business. We actually incorporated it in 2014 and are working very successfully for the past three years. But now we're trying to bring it to America. We're actually from Toronto and we want to make sure that we can work one-on-one -on -one with different communities that are experiencing it. So the city of Detroit, being so close to Toronto, uh, has experienced huge waves of community shifts. And that means there are certain areas that are not getting the support that they need. And they need the data to be able to say what to do with that health information. And so we are trying to help reduce asthma attacks in the communities by providing the devices to get that data so that they can actionably manage that environment. So that you understand for each child what that information means and to help make that difference. Thank you. And I hope if you have, uh, that you enjoyed the presentation. Yes, Nisha. Guess you thought you were done, but I, you weren't. I was trying to get away as fast <laughs> as possible. <laughs> so that I could breathe. Exactly. You did a great job. Uh, and it's always hard to be the first, so let's give her another round of applause. Thank you. Nisha and the other two people from Toronto over in the corner that were shouting out <laughs> over there. Okay. So we want to hear from the judges, and again, we're going to give you about uh, a minute to comment. We'll start, uh, ladies first, Vanessa. Uh, well, thank you so much for being first and telling <laughs> your story. Uh, I thought it was really great that obviously you really understand your customer very, very, very well. Um, I understand the fear that you're using a little bit. Uh, yeah, I can't Sorry about that. Uh, I'd, again, thank you for being, work, working on this and, and really, I thought that you had a really wonderful understanding of your customer uh, there. Um, I guess um, more sort of my um, questions are for you at this point, and I don't know, this might be a scoring thing too, because there's a difference between purpose and mission. So for you, like what would you characterize as your real purpose and what would you characterize as your mission? So our purpose is to really correlate air pollution to asthma attacks and how to reduce asthma attacks. But our mission is to be able to give that information to families and so that they can do something with it. That's where the device comes in, but it's really the, the data that lets them do something actionable to reduce the um, health impacts. Okay. Ryan, you have anything you want to add or a question? Thank you for sharing your business. Um, I thought it was a great uh, pitch and there was um, a lot of great storytelling within there. I would just say to rearrange that. So like the, uh, the connection point that you, um, the story that you told about your son, I would probably open with that because that was like a very strong, great uh, selling point to really hook, line, and sink um, potential investors or people in the audience to say, like this is my problem and I deal with it every day. So that connection point needs to be established a little bit sooner in the presentation, but overall I thought it was really good. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Mark? Thank you once again for coming out tonight. In terms of collecting the data, how do you propose to collect the data? So this data itself is very confidential. It's not like we're trying to sell that information. Basically, we're developing algorithms. So this device, it's a Wi-Fi enabled system that shows information in real time to our dashboard and app and sends information how to basically better manage your symptoms. But we're learning from that information and we're developing algorithms using our machine learning system to be able to give policy advice and forecast of how to address different neighborhoods, um, traffic and congestion problems. 
Okay. And Lawrence. Really awesome product. <laughs> like seriously, really awesome. Um, maybe I missed it, but I. You were super. You were really great at bringing clarity to who the end user is, but I was unclear as to who the customer is. Who's buying it? I understand who's using it. Who's buying it? So currently, we're looking at um, families who are highly susceptible to uh, pollution-based asthma. The secondary customers will be uh, retirement homes, um, nursing uh, homes, uh, daycares, facilities that are uh, dealing with uh, people who have more of a concern, breathing issues. Later on, we're looking at pushing that information to hospitals, insurance companies, and the likes. All right, thank you, judges. Now, Nisha, you are officially done. Thank you. <laughs> Our second contestant and finalist of the evening is Maria Rose Belding with Means Database. Good evening. My name is Maria Rose, and I'm the co-founder and executive director at the Means Database, a nonprofit that takes excess food and gives it to people in need. Our purpose is to prioritize dinner tables over dumpsters. And our mission in this initiative is to recover more than 50,000 pounds of food in the next three months. Although our organization works in 49 U.S. states and territories, for the purpose of this project, we're focused on Philadelphia. Philly is very much an American city, full of history and promise and inequity. This is our nation's largest, poorest municipality, and it also has the highest rates of both hypertension and congestive heart failure. One in four Philadelphians is relying on a food pantry or a soup kitchen. And last year, 90% of those agencies reported running out of food. The very last layer of Philly's safety net is fraying at the seams. Meanwhile, the United States throws away almost a third of its food supply, of its edible food supply. Hunger and food insecurity are just as complicated as any other social determinant of health in terms of the big mess of issues and circumstances that cause it. But unlike almost every other social determinant, the resources to address it are right in front of us. We can do that by combining two proven successful business models. Means, the organization I co-founded, is an information network. We send out free automated texts and or emails to soup kitchens, homeless shelters, and other emergency food feeding programs when there is food nearby. Our partner in this initiative, Food Connect, is an app-based travel nonprofit. They make sure food actually makes it from point A to point B. Together, we make it work in Philadelphia. Here's how this goes. Let's say you're a restaurant, and at the end of the night, you have 100 apples that didn't quite make it into that pie. You don't have time to call a bunch of people to see if they can take it, and you can't afford to pay somebody to come take it from you. But with us, you have a third option. Pull out your phone, open up the app. GPS tells us where you are. Your account tells us how to get a hold of you. Literally, all we need to know is what you've got and when you need it gone by. Means finds you a partner in an average of 20 minutes across the United States. And Food Connect deploys a driver to come pick it up. That's how this works. And it works to the tune of more than 5,000 pounds of food in less than six weeks' time in Philadelphia this summer. And here's the thing. Every single one of those meals fit USDA recommendations for salt, sugar, and fat. Every single one of them. Means and Food Connect share the same philosophy. We should be recovering healthy sustainable, nutritious food, not just any calories we can salvage. I come to this work because I've been volunteering in food pantry since I was five. And like so many of the clients at the food pantry I grew up working in, I have diabetes and heart disease. Mine are congenital. 
and even though I have type 1 diabetes and most of our clients have type 2, I almost always had the better blood sugars. Not because I was trying harder, but because my house always had fresh fruits and vegetables. On a good day, our type 2 clients would get fruit from us, but it was canned in syrup. It wasn't uncommon for the ones in renal failure to get things like ramen noodles. They didn't eat that because they didn't understand how unhealthy it was for them. They ate that because the only options were the food we had in the food pantry or no food at all. I am alive because I have always had what I needed to thrive, despite two different organ systems deciding to give out by the time I was 20. I am alive because of the zip code I was born in. And every single person in this country deserves that. Everybody. The founder of Food Connect, Mega, came to this country with her parents as a child. They had $40 in their pocket when they got here. She's now a real estate banker because her family used finite resources as effectively as they could. She realized the best way to solve this was to figure out how to transport it well. Together, we have been able to move more than 1.5 million pounds of food across the United States in the last two years. We realize food is the key to solving every other social determinant of health. Nobody's worried about stopping smoking when there's no food in the cupboard. My name is Maria Rose, and I'm the co-founder and executive director at The Means Database. Our purpose is to prioritize dinner tables over dumpsters, and our mission is to recover more than 60,000 pounds of food in Philadelphia in the next three months. Thank you so very much. Are there any questions for Maria Rose? Lawrence has one. Okay. So um, I applaud you for the level of clarity and conciseness in your delivery. Um, and I, I, I definitely get it for sure. Ultimately, um, how do you fund this? on an ongoing basis, meaning how do you create growth? It really is my only question. Nonprofit is a tax status, it's not a state of mind. Most of the for-profits in our space have failed because the average American retailer runs on a 1.5% profit margin in the food space. They can't afford to pay for it. What they can afford is to pay for a percentage of the value of all of the tax data that we aggregate. There's one company on our site that's donated more than $1.1 million worth of food on our site so far, just this year. You can claim 25% of fair market value at just the federal level. They can't claim that tax deduction without us. That's very valuable data and we will not give it up for free. We sell it back to the companies for a percentage of its value. That allows us to be sustainable and also make sure the company's morally correct decision and financially correct decision remain the same decision. All righty then. Finalist number two. Thank you, Maria Rose Belding. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's it, Maria. Yeah. Can, can you give her the mic so she can drop it? Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, I, I think that's it. You're good. Okay. You're good. Yeah, seriously, you're oh, good. I'm good. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, y'all. <laughs> All right, contestant number three and finalist to hit the stage is Sharon Butler with Eat Away Hunger. Sharon, come on up. Let's give her a round of applause. Hello. I'm Sharon Butler. Director of Eat Away Hunger, and we feed children in need. Our purpose is to eliminate childhood hunger, and our mission is to provide, is to give 300 children 165 amazing hunger-free days in a single school year. And our team is adopting the great city of Washington, D.C. I'd like to share a story with you. My friend had an eight-year-old. The principal knew his name, but not in the way you think. 
the teacher would give food to him when no one was watching because she knew that he wouldn't eat again until Monday when he returned to school. There was no food at home. The principal tried to do the right thing. They had a farmer's market and a food pantry. But her eight-year-old son struggled to carry that heavy bag of fresh fruit and vegetables home. But it didn't matter. His mother didn't cook anyway, and that food went to waste in many ways. When he tried to eat the green banana in the bag, he got a stomach ache. And his mother said, boy, I told you don't bring that food home anyway. They blamed the food. They didn't know the banana just needed to ripen. The food pantry had the good food, but he wouldn't bring any home because his mother would just sell it anyway. The, the food was canned fruits and vegetables and cereal, and his mother sold that. She sold everything for her medication. But it, did, it should not have been that way because she lived rent free. She got food stamps. There was no reason she couldn't take care of her boys. There was no reason her boys went to the grocery store and stole food to eat. The principal knew what was going on. He watched that boy taste everything he touched. He even ate the paper off straws because he wanted to know what stuff tastes like. The poor boy, he was lacking nutrition and he just didn't know it. I saw in him a bright, intelligent child. But lack of food stifled his growth. By the age of 20, he was living in Ward 7 or 8. It didn't matter which one. Both have high unemployment rates, high crime rates. More people are unemployed than educated. And this is the only ward in the city that has three grocery stores combined. The other wards have an average four grocery stores in each ward. Her son was hopeless. He had no future. He was illiterate. He'd never held a job. And as a matter of fact, sixth grade was his last year in school. And that's because middle school teachers didn't feed him like his, like his elementary principal and teacher did. Middle school was totally different. He seldom ate. He stole more. Poor boy. He could have graduated high school if only he'd had something to eat. Now, my story is similar. I live in Ward 8. I'm not on drugs. I have no addictions. I supported the school. I support my kids' homework. I supported the principal's mission. I do this because I know that no one else is putting little, little food in little hands. I do this because unlike other, other food services, our program fuels children's future. Our program provides food that children can eat themselves without the benefit of their parent. Nothing goes to waste. I, I answer the principal's call to give at-risk children a chance. I will eliminate childhood hunger. I will provide 300 meals. I will provide 300 children 165 amazing hunger-free days in a single school year. I am Sharon Butler. I will adopt Washington, D.C.'s Ward 8, and I will help children eat away hunger and crave success. All right, we're going to start with uh, some comments by Mark. 
That's all. Thank you. And a wonderful presentation, Sharon. Question, how did you come up with the 165 hunger-free days? If we started in September, for example, it would take a few meals to build up steam. So you can't go in right away expecting kids to be filled. Thank you. Ryan? Thank you for sharing your story. Um, very powerful. Um, what, what is the plan to actually provide um, these children with food? Like, where are you sourcing it from? Um, where are you aggregate? Is, is, is it through donations or food banks? What, what's the plan for that? It's been through grants and donations, and we'll continue to search for grants and donations. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Sharon Butler. Thank you. Thank Eat you. Don't forget, out here you can also you. participate. You. And for those who are watching the live stream, Slido, S L I dot D O. And then, of course, uh, the code there, Empowered to Serve. So definitely vote, OK? Our next finalist is Kenny Fennell. Actually, we have two, Kenny Fennell and Benjamin Morse, the tag team with Caravan. Come on up, Kenny and Benjamin. <laughs> or we have a change. I'm sorry? Oh, one minute. Okay, they need one minute, too. Yeah, it's in my pocket. Is that okay? One minute. <laughs> and we'll be back in one minute. Is that good? All right, thank you so much. Okay, here's Kenny. Here's Benjamin. Welcome. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> oh. All right. Hi, everyone. My name's Kenny Fennell, and this is Benjamin Morse. We're the co-founders of Caravan. We provide commuter shuttles for workforce development graduates and their employers. Our purpose is to unleash urban potential, and our mission is to provide Detroit residents with one million rides to work. The cost is about $20 per person, and it's shared between the employer and the employee. A year ago, I met a 32-year-old man named Daryl Johnson. He lives on the east side of Detroit, and he's lived there his whole life, literally. He's never left. It's not because he doesn't want to. He's tried to take his first steps towards his dreams for interviewing for jobs in downtown. He's also interviewed for jobs in the suburbs. But every time the interviewer asks, so how will you get to work? His heart that was once filled with excitement, it sinks, because he knows he doesn't have a reliable way to get to work. He borrowed his friend's car for the interview, but after that, it's the bus. Employers don't like that, because the bus is a two-hour ride from his home on the east side to most jobs, which means he'll always be late. So Daryl doesn't get the job. He doesn't take his first steps towards pursuing his dreams. Now, Daryl is simply pursuing his version of the American dream. He seeks purpose and dignity. And he just wants access to the same tools that I had growing up in a poor family in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Now, Cambridge is a city that spurred presidents from Harvard and innovators from MIT. But my beginnings were more humble. My father's from working class East Cambridge. My mother's from El Salvador. She came to the US in 1986, brought by her mother to flee civil war. And she met my father while they were working as cashiers at McDonald's. About a year later, I was born to teenage parents, 18 years old. However, and because we had nothing, I actually spent the first year of my life with my mother, growing up in charitable housing run by Catholic nuns. However, despite having nothing, not even college educations, my parents were able to grow us out of poverty. And one of the most important tools we had in that growth was the red line, the subway line that runs from Cambridge to Boston, because that line provided my father reliable transportation to a job fixing computers, a job where he was able to, to grow up, and we were able to grow out of poverty. Those are the first steps of the journey that led me to this stage today. But what does it mean for folks like Daryl, the thousands like him across the city of Detroit, 
in cities from Baltimore to Indianapolis to Los Angeles. Folks who can't take the first steps on their journey because they don't have the reliable transportation to even get a job. There's no red line for them. Luckily, I didn't have to think about this alone because I met Benjamin Morse. I've been traveling internationally since I was three years old, and every, everywhere I went, my family made it a priority to go out, have cross-cultural experiences uh, in the local areas. I, I remember learning about identity and privilege and social injustice at a young age. I remember being in Aruba with my father, and he took my sister and I out for a meal in the local village. I remember asking, Dad, why are all the people in the hotel white and rich, and all the people in the village are black and poor? And this was a, a realization that stuck with me, and I, I never did find out the answer to that question. Uh, this continued when I was in Ethiopia as a Peace Corps volunteer, where I learned about the sociological reasons behind economic segregation and structural racism and poverty. And I learned to listen first and act second. And my counterpart, Abadi Abraha, and I were able to coordinate meetings with decision makers such as the mayor of our village and local community members that otherwise would not have had a voice in that conversation. And this is what we've done in Detroit. We started by listening. We think we have one thing, one thing that we can do to influence millions of lives, and that's to get people to work comfortably, affordably, and with compassion and care. Having a job isn't just about making money. It's about having purpose and dignity. So imagine this. It's January 2018, and Daryl goes online and books a caravan for next morning at 7 a.m. And he sleeps easy. He knows that he'll be able to get to work in the morning. And the next day, caravan shows up right on time. And as he walks over to the van, he feels that excitement again, the excitement of possibility, because he knows he's taking his first step towards a job, and he'll be there in 30 minutes and on time, not two hours and late. And as the doors open, he sees the other passengers, and the driver says, hey, Daryl, how's it going today? You ready? Let's ride. My name's Kenny Fennell. This is Benjamin Morse. We're Caravan. Our purpose is to unleash urban potential. Our mission is to provide Detroiters one million rides to work. Thank you. Very nicely done. No, I want y'all to get it. All right, great. <laughs> the podium, eh? Very nicely done. All right, Vanessa. Thank you for your presentation. It's really great to hear about this. Um, so, question on my mind is how, how are you going to pay for this? Who pays? Um, and kind of how are you going to do that? Yeah, so uh, from interviewing customer discovery and all that fun work, we've actually talked to two employers in Detroit who struggle the other side of the equation, which is workforce supply, workers. Um, they want to open new factories, but they don't know where to identify the workforce. Uh, to open those factories, and so that's what we're connecting. We know there are neighborhoods in Detroit that are overlooked because folks can't get to these jobs. Um, so they're willing to do a cost share with this between the employer and the employee. Lawrence? So in your mind, how do you drive growth, uh, let's say, over the next five years? Growth, uh, which kind of group? <laughs> for the city or for our scale? No, scaling your scaling mm -hmm. business. So for us, um, we're in the pilot stage right now. We're pursuing that with uh, talking to the city of Detroit, the two employers and three nonprofits that have decades of experience. And it's our job to learn as much as possible, as fast as possible. That's what we'll do through these pilots. We'll learn where the drivers need to come from, what kind of lease partnerships we need to set up for the vehicles, whether we're owning the asset or someone is providing the asset that we lease from them. Um, or even if we have to take a nonprofit designation, keep the same business model and then generate earned revenue and help, uh, I guess, finance that with philanthropic dollars. But our goal is not to do that. We want to be profitable. Um, so that's the growth. And then we've seen similar problems, I'm going to add on, in Baltimore, uh, in Indianapolis, where they're struggling with a similar issue. Uh, and even talking to someone in the audience earlier in, in Virginia, where Amazon has a warehouse distribution center. But public transit doesn't go there. And so we think there's lots of opportunities that are just overlooked because folks mostly take transportation for granted. Everyone just gets in their car. But that's not true for a lot of folks. All right, thank you, Kenny and Benjamin. Very nicely done. Thank you. Thank you.
how to come up with some of these ideas. Oh, these Thank folks you. are uh, doing a great job. Okay, we have our next finalist to come to the stage, Daniel Brillman from Unite Us. Daniel, come on up. Um, I think what they're doing is uh, changing out the mics. So. Daniel Brillman, come on down. Good evening. Good evening. All right. My name is Dan Brillman. I'm the, uh, the co founder and CEO of Unite Us. And in a world where healthcare and social services tend to be siloed, Unite Us is a technology that digitally connects service providers from healthcare government and social services to coordinate care and address the needs of their local community. Now our purpose is to unite healthcare and community services together. And our mission here is to reduce heart disease in the Mississippi Delta region by 10%. So the Mississippi Delta region, the highest cause of death is heart disease and the highest rate in the nation at 25%. And there's other risks associated with this like obesity, uh, smoking, and high blood pressure. The poverty rate, no surprise, is 40% when the national average is 15%. So all these statistics I'm talking about are related to the social determinants of health. What's happening in the community, not just in the hospital. There's a lot of services available to help people in need, we know that. But they're not always effectively working together. So let's take Laura Williams, head of social work and a discharge planner at the cardiovascular unit at Greenwood LaFleur Hospital in Mississippi. She discharges almost 20 people a day. So to say she's inundated is, is an understatement. And she works closely with each patient to identify not only their, their health needs like primary care, but she spends more time addressing social needs like food insecurity, employment, housing. And many of these patients have more than one need, which makes it even harder to manage their care. And so she works 12 hour shifts, but she even works even more than that because she's spending a lot of time trying to connect them with the right services at the right time. And so it's not just a lack of resources available, they're, they're available. It's around the connectivity and the visibility of her patients after they leave the hospital. So when she discharges someone, she doesn't know what happens. So she's asking herself questions. Did they make their appointment? Did they get their Medicaid benefits? Did they get into the housing that they needed? And that's very important to her. And a lot of these folks are coming back to the hospital, and that's the only way she knows if they got care. And a lot of them are coming back because they didn't get the services in the community. And she's very frustrated because she's in a delivery system that isn't optimized to deliver health and social services. So it reminds me of a story uh, back in 2012 when I was deployed to the Middle East as a pilot in the Air Force. And I was flying in Afghanistan, and I got to work with a young airman named Phil, 22 years old from Philadelphia, great looking guy, had a lot of fun working with him. And we got to know each other, and even though I was an officer, he felt comfortable coming to me and asking me about a mortgage. Now, we were trying to get home, we wanted to get home from the tour, um, but I didn't know anything about mortgages, I've never had a mortgage. And, but he trusted me. So, that was enough for me to help him. So I spent that deployment helping him get all the resources together, but really what I was focused on was the outcome. I wanted to make sure he got that mortgage so he had a home for him and his family. Now I think that word got around and I had some airmen calling me about other needs after I got home, asking me about mental health, about healthcare, about housing, about employment, all over the country I even had things that I needed myself. And so I figured in every community there was a service delivery system that put together public, private, nonprofit agencies. It was all fairly seamless. The more research I did, turns out that didn't exist. Right? So a cohesive, centralized, and transparent system that can deliver the right point of care, get me to the right service at the right time when I want it, we do this for every other technology, 
did not exist. So for me, it was very important to think about that because I was using Google search engines, which we all like, that's fine. And most importantly, that's why Unitas was born. Out of necessity, inspired to drive change. And we've been doing this in 30 plus communities now, and we've done great work, but we are nowhere close to getting all this work done. And if we don't get it done, people that need services don't get the help they need, and things don't change. So the urgency is now in communities with leaders and providers coming together to work seamlessly together to make sure that it's easier to access care and easier to provide care. So we want to focus on the Mississippi Delta region and bring communities, community providers, and healthcare together so that they can manage what happens outside their four walls. And so we can provide tools to people like Ms. Williams, who then can make her patients healthier and the entire community healthier. And that's what Unitas is about, but we all have to do it together. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Daniel. First of all, thank you for your service. We certainly appreciate that. Um, question from Mark. So, thank you, Daniel. Nice, pre wonderful presentation. How do you plan to make that digital connection, if you could, please? Sure. So there's a couple, a couple of ways, obviously. Technology is one thing. But on the other end, it's the case manager and the social workers, right? So you have to deliver value to them. They're doing this work manually, on paper, by phone, by email, with whoever they can. There is no streamlined, centralized service delivery. But they all know each other informally, or they figure out how to get their patients there. So you need a champion. Right? So there's United Ways we work with, there's hospital systems. These are all champions in the community that are trying to figure this out, and they're all working with community partners at the same time. So I call it herding the cats is the first thing. You gotta get them in the room, talk to each other about a common mission. Probably talked about collective impact and social determinants today. So a lot of those principles apply. And get everyone on the same page on why they're doing it, and what, and what you're replacing and what you're disrupting. Vanessa? Um, so you mentioned working with the Mississippi Delta specifically. Like, can you characterize like, why in that particular that region outside the other 30 communities you've already been working in? Yeah, absolutely. So a lot of you know a lot of the communities we're working in. There's definitely an identified need, but the research that we've done um, with heart disease, especially when it's associated with diabetes and associated with a lot of things that are taken care of in the community, um, that's probably the most pressing, especially with uh, the co-occurrence of poverty rate along with the healthcare uh, continuum that's going on. So that's probably the most opportunity given the statistics in that community. And the most opportunity because a lot of the providers are seeing patients every day and they're coming in and saying, hey, I also need this service, I need this service, um, but they only provide one service. And so that's where the cohesive knit comes in, in in that region. All right, thank you very much, Daniel. Thank you. Thanks. Again, don't forget, you here can vote. Just go online to slido.com. That's www.sli.do. And then you can put empowered to serve all one word. And you can definitely um, vote. And for those who are watching the live stream, please do so as well. Go to slido.com and vote because you may end up, if we have a tie, it may be your vote that breaks that tiebreaker. So. All right, we are going to continue with our next finalist. Moving on, let's welcome Cecil Wilson from Gophers to the stage. Cecil. We just want to say Cecil already has 10 points. That's my daddy's name, so he already is 10 points ahead of everybody else. So come on up, Cecil. Hello, DC. Hi, my name is Cecil Wilson, and I'm the CEO and founder of a company called Gophers. We are an on-demand delivery network that is currently serving the Southland region of Chicago. And basically, we connect our customers to safe and reliable delivery drivers called runners in their communities that can pick up and drop off just about anything our customers need, whether it's groceries, dry cleaning, takeout food, etc. Once the customers submit their job requests, it is confirmed and connected to the nearest runner in the community. And once the runner uh, approves and starts the job, the customer will be updated via text message till completion. 
I know, you've heard this before. And I'm not going to stand up here and tell you we're better because our runners are faster or fancier or because they wear cute orange outfits, which they do. But no, I believe what makes us different is the purpose that we do all of this, which is to send out a very clear message to the communities that we serve, which is simply this. We need each other. I often tell people all I have really built is a platform that allows neighbors to help neighbors. And I believe through these human connections, this is how we build stronger communities. And that is our ultimate purpose, to build stronger communities, one human connection at a time. Therefore, our mission becomes creating these opportunities for people in their community to get connected. Whether it's helping the elderly individual who needs their prescription picked up from the pharmacy, or helping the working mother who needs to put dinner on the table at night. And they need to get connected to the runner, that young adult in the community who needs the income. But the only problem is there's this disconnect that we have in our communities that don't allow us to trust each other. I mean, think about it. When is the last time you actually talked to the person at the checkout line at the grocery store? Yes, that is the disconnect that I'm talking about. However, it's interesting because that's actually not a disconnect I'm too familiar with because I am the youngest of seven and we were just the P of poor. We didn't even have a grocery store. <laughs> See, we did live in a food desert. <laughs> and I tell you because being the youngest of seven, we didn't have a grocery store, but we did have what you call a candy lady which is basically a woman who sells junk food at her house. And being the youngest, of course, I was always the designated go-to person when my brothers and sisters wanted me to pick something up for them. So, eventually, so I did it after so long, and around six years old, I started to see this little business for myself. So I created an office out of my closet. So moving forward, when my brothers and sisters want me to go to the candy store for them, I had to come to my office, fill out some paperwork with crayons and construction paper, or creating up their list. And... You know, it's interesting because as I got older, my identity pretty much stayed the same, which is being that go-to helper person that people relied on to just help them, you know, whether it's delivering things or helping them around the house or, and if I knew I couldn't help them, I always knew someone who could. And that leads us to where we are today. I am currently 21 years of age and I am just getting started. And, <laughs> and I tell you, that passion to serve others has been the driving force that has led me from crayons to career. I'm happy to say that currently we em create employment opportunities for 50 runners on our platform and counting. And I believe that through these human connections, that same passion to serve has also been a magnet for other people that has the same passion to serve, and the, serve the underserved. So with that being said, you know, our goal moving forward is to continue creating new innovative ways to connect people in their community, such as our new branch called Gophers Connect, which is a web-based platform that connects customers with service-based businesses in their community, as well as Taskers, which is a network of non-skilled stationary assistants that basically provides an extra pair of hands around the house when you need it. And lastly, Gophers Cares, which is a philanthropic program that enables people to use our service who couldn't otherwise afford it, and that is funded through generous customer donations. So, with all that being said, our goal moving forward is to continue building strong communities, one human connection at a time, and with the funds, if we would be awarded today, we'll be continued to uh, strengthen our communities through these human connections, as well as um, to build a stronger technical infrastructure through our app. So all in all, well, all in all, I will say this. It has given me no greater privilege than to build a platform that has taken my passion to serve as a little boy and to use that as a magnet that empowers other people to serve. Thank you. So when I was 21, I was at RJ's by the lake trying to get into the club in Dallas. Trying to get in before they started charging at 10 o'clock. <laughs> and you at 21 have started an internet web-based application that helps people. And that is why I'm doing what I'm doing and he is going to run the world. So, all right, Cecil. So what questions do we have for Cecil? Let's start with Ryan. You really want to know why you're doing what you're doing? <laughs> Ryan, why no, am no, I I'm joking, joking. <laughs> Hook them horns, hook them horns. Hook them horns, that's uh, right. <laughs> great job, Cecil. Um, thank you for sharing your business and um, great storytelling up there. I would, I'm going to give you a little pushback on your mission, though, and, and say, all right, 
your differentiation, like your value proposition, like what does that mean we need each other? And really how do you clearly define and articulate and say, well, I'm different than TaskRabbit or I'm different than any other gig economy service. Um, you know, I think that is, is really what's going to take you over the top. But um, to the point, what I was doing at 21, you're way ahead of me. So, you know, <laughs> what do I know? But, you know, really just honing in and defining because um, the gig economy is very crowded right now. So really, what is your strong value proposition and why would people uh, use your service as opposed to already established um, type companies? It's something to really think through and, and hone in and just as a... Um, uh, something to throw out there, you know, with, with that we need each other type of mentality, maybe creating something that's very community-oriented, community, community oriented, um, like a neighborhood type program. So, like, you know, if you have small children, you know, can I send you a message to go watch my kids or make sure they get home? Something like that um, I think would be very a, a very powerful web-based uh, mobile application as well, too. So, yeah. good job, though. Great job. I will dismiss you in just a minute, Cecil. So we have some more. I know, I know you're trying to get off the stage. Okay, Vanessa, yes. <laughs> no, I understand. Um, no, really great drop up there, just despite the fact that you keep trying to run away. Uh, <laughs> um, I just have one more question for you. Like, I, I love the purpose of what you're doing and trying to really increase this like kind of social cohesion and community, but can you tell us a little bit more about how you are building trust like on your platform? Because like that's one of the biggest barriers to a lot of gig economy is like how do we know that we can trust the person that's in our private space, in our home, um, and what are you thinking about? What are you doing now? and What are you thinking about in the future for continuing to perpetuate that? Okay. Um, well, Right now, I mean, as far as the, the, the system of it all, we do background checks, which is the main thing that customers look at to make sure they're safe. However, as it relates to that trust aspect, the only way we do that is by really being very visible and present in the communities that we serve. So we've developed great partnerships with all the communities. We're at all the local events. And, you know, anything there's a, anytime there's a need in the community, you're going to see that logo there, being there, being present. As we can sponsor, we'll sponsor it. So being very present and visible. So when they see these runners or whoever's going on our platform, they've seen them before somewhere else, and they've already talked to them, and there's some type of connection prior to just delivering grapes or whatnot. So that's the way that we plan on continuing to do that, really just being present, being there, being visible as a company um, and the communities that we serve. Really, really great presentation. You, you started out super strong. Um, not quite sure you kind of toward the end, but you started out really strong. So kudos to you, you. for sure. I, I don't have anything. Mark, you want to say anything? OK. All right, now you can go see some. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have a couple more finalists. Our next one coming to the stage is Ricky Wynn from See What I See. Ricky, where are you? Come on up. Oh, and if we already know this is going to be a great presentation. Come on up, Ricky. Good evening. <laughs> My name is Ricky Wynn. I'm the co-founder of Virtually B. Our product is Swiss. See what I see. Our purpose is to enable seniors to live without limitations. Our mission is to provide access to personalized and uplifting experiences through alternate reality. We adopt the great cities of Dallas and Fort Worth, Texas. At the tender age of 47, me and my wife were blessed with the opportunity to care for her parents during their senior years. This experience made us intimately, intimately familiar with the challenges that seniors face today. They have all these disabilities, they have all this time on their hands, but they have all these things that they can't do. They can't drive. They have all these limitations. Wouldn't it be great if they could leverage the energy and mobility of family members, friends, caretakers 
to reach out again into the world and experience alternate reality. More recently in my life, I had to take on the difficult task of taking care of my wife after she was stricken with a serious terminal illness. She was a very active, vibrant, 56 years old. She was a very spiritually strong and God-loving woman. She loved her spicy food, yellow rice and black beans. <laughs> and she was one of those people that she always spoke of her mind. She always told you what she was thinking. But now she faced these physical limitations and disabilities. One day, as we were leaving chemotherapy and on our way home, we stopped at one of her favorite places to get her some lunch. She told me, she says, I can't get out today. You know, I just can't go in there. I said, okay, we'll try to use FaceTime. I'll take my, my phone in and we'll use FaceTime and you can look at the selections and I'll help you out. Problem was, it just didn't work that well. It was awkward and she got very frustrated. I struggled with the camera trying to get the right angle. The lighting was off. She finally told me in her standard language, just forget it. <laughs> it really pained me that I couldn't help her with such a simple problem. Through 24 years of marriage, she always had my back. And this was just a simple thing. At that time, Vanessa had become one of over 18 million people who require assistance. They say they require assistance with daily normal activities. That's a number much higher than previously thought, and it puts a heavy burden on families in the health care system. During my career, I have built many, many systems and solved many problems similar to this. So my partner and I and our technical team have gotten together and designed, designed a solution for this problem. It consists of an app which can run on your tablet, your smartphone, your computer, and a special pair of glasses. For that problem that Vanessa and I faced that day, if I had Swiss, I would have simply put on the glasses, gone into the market, used the app on my phone to connect with her, and she would have seen this button on her phone ringing, saying, it's your obnoxious husband, husband in the market. Please answer the phone. And she just pressed that button and she would have seen what I could see in the market. Problem solved. We are virtually B. Our purpose is to enable seniors to live life without limitations. Our mission is to provide access to personalized, uplifting experiences through alternate reality. My name is Ricky Wynn, and we represent the great cities of Dallas and Fort Worth, Texas, and I thank you for listening to my story. Extra 10 points for being from Dallas, Fort Worth, so that's <laughs> native Texan, so. All right, we're gonna start with Lawrence. Do you have any questions or comments? So, um, I, I definitely get it. I get the value proposition. But the key question is, how is this different from FaceTime? I'm sorry? How is it different from FaceTime? Oh, well, I mean, I think you kind of heard some of it in, in my discussion. Um, 
it's coming at eye level, for one thing, so you see what I see. And the technology in the glasses automatically is just the light, lighting and, and other things. And the focus is exactly within what a person, what you're seeing, what a person would see. You know, FaceTime is not really designed for that. So it is specifically designed for this type of application. And, and the application that I discussed was just one application. We found many other applications for this. You know, a sick and shut-in person can, you know, uh, visit their child's birthday party. You know, things like that. Uh, you know, you can, you can go to a concert with your teenager if you want to. Uh, so... The teenagers may not like that, but yes, that yeah, might work. Yeah, I'll forget. Yeah, you're right yeah. about that. Uh, Mark, nothing. Okay. Any other questions? Ryan? I really like this idea. I think um, when we talk about virtual reality and augmented reality, particularly for the elderly, and really um, providing them valuable experiences and giving them the opportunity to experience um, cities, countries, whatever it is. Um, in their current home or if they're in an elderly home or they're not able to get around. So if you throw in a headset and say, all right, well, I want to go to Paris today, you go to Paris. And you go walk around in Paris and see the Eiffel Tower. Exactly. I think that is um, really, really interesting. And in particularly when you think about building a business around that and, I guess, distributing and, and very specifically targeting um, uh, senior care facilities and you know, licensing out technology, building some um, some creative destinations or experiences through your app um, or, or your product. I think that could be really interesting. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ricky. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Are you guys enjoying it so far? You guys are? Yes. We have some wonderful innovators out there. Our next finalist to hit the stage, Niyasha Niyama Fene. And I hope I was at least close on that, Niyasha. Hello. My name is Niyasha Niyamafene, and I'm the founder of Gospel Run. Our purpose is to revolutionize urban health, building on a foundation of faith, community, and love. We produce endurance running and walking events that have already inspired thousands of sedentary men, women, and children to get up, get active, and believe that change is possible. Since our Chicago launch, we've built over 100 run-walk teams, ranging in size from four to 400, and we're on a mission to build up to 10,000 teams nationally, starting right here in DC. We often get asked how it is that we're able to change health behaviors. So I'll tell you a story of one of our gospel runners, who's one of our favorites. She's actually a walker named Tanya, and Tanya is fabulous. She has a great job and travels all over the country, eating at all these great restaurants, posting a selfie every day of her fabulousness. <laughs> Tanya also weighs over 300 pounds, cannot climb a flight of stairs, and cannot walk a block. And she set up her life in such a way that she doesn't have to. And because she's reached the age of 40 without a diagnosis, she believes that she is fine. This is her normal. So one day, Tanya's in church, and she hears her pastor talking about this gospel run 5K race that he, his family, and the entire congregation will run if he had his way. And she thinks about that 3.1 miles, but she just doesn't believe she could ever do that. But as the months go by and she hears about it ad nauseum, she starts to see a lot of other people who have done it who look like her. And to her surprise, when her church starts training and asks her to join their team, she says yes. So now she's walking regularly for the first time, becoming unrecognizable to herself as someone who not only exercises, but likes it. <laughs> we fast forward to her big day, the race, and she is beaming from ear to ear. The music is incredible, the spirit is palpable, it's a celebration, it's a love fest, and she belongs. And then the race starts. 
She's doing her thing. Mile one, hey. Mile two, selfie. Mile three. <laughs> Mile three, she's struggling. She's trying to remember why she thought this was a good idea. And she remembers the commitment she made to herself, but she also sees all these people who don't know her, but that want her to win. That offer to come help her run that last mile, to get her across that finish line, and she does. And now this fabulous woman, who once ferociously resisted the very mention of the word healthy, is a health advocate. Now her daily selfies are of her walking adventure and how she can't believe that this is her new normal. When she travels to new cities, instead of the best restaurants, she's looking for the best walking trails because she's getting in her miles, she's changing her nutrition, she's, joining, she's building her own gospel run team. So we salute you, Tanya. And yes, you can post this. So as a founder, this work is very personal to me because in the family that I grew up in, our normal was sickness and disease. I had a mom with diabetes and cancer who was in a nursing home by the age of 60 and on dialysis for years until she just said enough. I had a dad with hypertension who over 13 years had more strokes and heart attacks than we could count. A brother who for 15 years battled severe schizophrenia until he passed away at the age of 35. And I'm not going to get into the addiction, but yeah, there was that too. So by the age of 10, I had a mission to save my family. I wasn't having this. And by the age of 13, I had the campaign all mapped out. We we're going to stop eating McDonald's every day, cook healthy food, do more Jane Fonda. I got this. I got us. We can fix this. By the age of 18, I thought that if I just prayed more and fasted longer and joined hands with the right people, maybe we could convince God to fix this. But I wasn't able to save or heal my family. But I did work very, very hard to save and heal myself. And in Gospel Run, we're creating a vehicle that en enables entire communities to save and heal themselves. Thank you. Not so fast, Missy. Oh. <laughs> Why people don't like to be on stage with me? Okay. I forgot. <laughs> there's more. Yes, there's more. All right. Uh, Mark. Thank you. Wonderful presentation. How do you select the runners? The runners self select. We work with institutional partners. So we have over, when I said we had over 100 teams, we work with uh, mostly faith based organizations and partner with them. And they set their own goals about how big their teams will be. And like I said, some of our teams are as big as 400 people. Um, some of them are as small as four people. But um, you know, we have a multi channel marketing platform. We're very, very aggressive with getting the word out. Thank you. Vanessa. I love this and going back to the talk during lunch today about franchising, this sounds like perfect for that. Um, and I love the fact that you're going to faith-based organizations and meeting them where they are and the sort of social influence, social support. It's very public health driven. Like, I think it's fantastic. Thank you. Okay. Coming to a location in the DMV near you. All right. <laughs> sounds good. Lawrence, anything? Can you, can you provide a little more insight on the marketing piece and what that looks like? Um, so... Uh, it's, it's a multi-platform of strategy. Institutional marketing is the lion's share of what we do, partnering with uh, faith-based organizations, supporting them in building their teams with whatever tools they need. Um, we are also uh, building audience on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. We just started a YouTube channel. Um, NBC5 Chicago is our broadcast partner. We have radio partnerships as well. Um, we do print, street team. Uh, we're pretty aggressive. Ryan, you have anything? Um, how do you incentivize people to exercise? I think um, when, I, when you were given the illustration about mile one, mile two, mile three, so those are like mile markers. So if I'm running and I make it to mile one, maybe I get a t-shirt. <laughs> mile two, like how do you incentivize people to, to participate and actually get out there and, and connect and, and exercise. And I think um, along those lines, it'd be really interesting if you were able to aggregate a group of people per cause. So like if the American Heart Association has 
an annual 5K or a walk? Can you aggregate a certain amount of individuals to participate in the walk? And when you're raising awareness for that association, you're welcome, by the way. <laughs> Pam, Pam, Eric, Pamela. Listen, right, but you're, you're raising awareness for the, uh, for, the, for the cause, right? And you're getting people out to participate. Uh, but then, you know, you're also supporting your cause of actually exercising, yes. right? And what does that look like? Do you get like a nice T-shirt or, you know, some goodie bag? And then that's reinforced marketing from the American Heart Association. So there, I think there's a lot of interesting opportunities that you could probably tinker and work with here. But overall, great presentation. Thank you. So there are, oh, should I answer? No, no, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. So um, in terms of incentives, there are so many. Uh, we are all about incentives. I think big picture, our goal is to really build social capital around positive health behaviors and build community around health and faith. So we do that through um, a lot of people choose to do the race because their church is doing it, their pastor is doing it, or their friends, or they're part of a team that they were asked to join. Um, so peer pressure is great. <laughs> we do team competitions, which are a huge motivator. Um, our top three teams each year get trophies. That gets the pastors riled up because they're competing against one another. Um, we do, of course, the standard race uh, swag, t-shirts. We just started doing finishers, medals. We do age category awards. Um, but I think we also um, have started piloting um, allowing churches to be fundraising partners. Um, and so some of our churches are actually doing the race um, and raising money for a specific project that they've identified and applied for to be approved by their church. So that is also a huge incentive. As we know, charity runners are a big part of the running industry. Yeah. And churches are not allowed to become charity partners of any race other than ours. All right, Niasha, thank you very much. Thank we certainly you. appreciate it, thank you. All right, we are down to the final two. And before we get to the final finalists, we're going to give it up for our next finalist, Sequoia Ross with Tricycle Urban Agriculture. Sequoia, come on up. Oh, we've got that one minute delay again. They're changing out the mics, okay? So again, don't forget to go online and vote. If we have a tiebreaker, because I know the judges are gonna have a hard time choosing tonight. We may have to use your vote online and for those who are watching the live stream to break the tie. We mentioned earlier that there's more than $60,000 worth of prizes to be given out tonight. They'll get half of it up front and the other half when they complete their mission. And we've seen tonight where a lot of folks have had some great presentations. So good luck, Lawrence, Vanessa, Mark, and Ryan on trying to find out who's the number one tonight. Number one, two, and three. All right, ladies and gentlemen, Miss Sequoia, come on up. Sequoia Ross. Oh, two for one. All right, here we go. Double trouble. Okay. Good evening, everyone. My name is oh, my name is Sequoia Ross, and I'm the outreach manager at Tricycle Urban Ag. Beth Nelson, and I'm the Urban Agriculture Fellowship Program Manager for Tricycle. Our purpose is to take our food back, and our mission is to teach people how to grow cucumbers and community from concrete. And we hail from the great city of uh, Richmond, Virginia. Richmond. Richmond. <laughs> Give it up for Richmond. This isn't my story. This is the story of a young woman that has 
that believes that we are what we eat. She has seen her community divided by gentrification and industry. She's watched grocery stores become dialysis clinics. And she's watched dilapidated housing become condos overnight. She understands that community means more than that. And she also values family, wellness, and health. She's trying to build a lifestyle brand using urban agriculture, but she lacks those resources. She doesn't have the knowledge. She doesn't have the background. And that's why she chose our program. And like her, we see possibilities where there are none. And here I am. <laughs> we look at um, concrete and we see we can grow cucumbers. Where there are potholes, we can grow some pole beans. We see the possibilities of connecting with our food like we have not been in a really long time in some of our lives. And we see possibilities of connecting with our community while we're doing that. Tricycle began as the leaders and the innovators of community gardens in Richmond. But that is not who we are anymore. We see now that we have to dive into food access and we have to build up farmers, city farmers, farmers that understand how to manipulate city soil, farmers that aren't intimidated by growing food in backyards, rooftops, churches, medians, you name it. They can cultivate food from seed to sale. And so from our beginning with our founders who started those community gardens throughout the city of Richmond, they started these gardens that are filled with small plots that are feeding their friends and their immediate family. But we see that new frontier of growing farms all over our city that are feeding more more than two or three, we're talking like 100 people per farm. Yes. And so when we look at our city, um, that's what we want to do. We want our city neighbors to know their farmer because their farmer is the person that lives right next door to them. Right. We see that we want our neighbors to also know where their food comes from because it, it's grown right on their block. Um, there is an abundance of nutrients and life that comes from eating food that you know where it came from, that came from soil where you live. We see that in the work that we do every day and we wanna make sure that we're bringing it out to everybody. That's right. So how are we going to do this, Sequoia? We've got to take our food back. There we are. <laughs> we have to take our food back. Back to a time when food was not mass-produced and grown miles, hundreds of miles away from where we live. We have to take our food back. Back to a time when food wasn't chemically laden and heavily laden with harsh pesticides and herbicides. Tricycle is building a community to empower people to grow food in the city. You don't have to live out in the royal areas to grow food. Whether it be herbs in your windowsill or squash in a tire in your backyard, we can do this. Whether you grew up with canned goods or food from the farm, we can do it. We can do it. We can do it. And we can empower those people to say, I can take up my rake, I can take up my, my back, what is it called? Not a backhoe. <laughs> <laughs> we, and we, and we're so, so in the city you don't need a tractor, but. That's right, we You're, you're on board, you're on board. See me after this, see me after this. But you can <laughs> grow food in your backyard and you can empower other people to grow food so that we can make food accessible to areas that don't have fresh food. So my name is Beth Nelson and I am the Urban Agriculture Fellowship Manager. I'm Sequoia Ross and our purpose is to take our food back and our mission is to teach people how to grow cucumbers and community from concrete. Thank you very much. <clears throat> <sighs> And
And as someone who has shelled enough purple hole peas in her lifetime, I know <laughs> what that is to actually have fresh uh, food in the backyard in Texas. All right, do we have a question? Uh, we'll start with Mark. Let me see you, Mark. As I <laughs> and Beth, let me give you the... Okay. Thank you, wonderful presentation, by the way. Um, how do you plan to get this, you know, I'm a city person, so right. how do you plan to get those city folks to the farm in the city? Right. So we have an Urban Agriculture Fellowship Program that we have piloted this year. Um, they, we have 10 fellows that started with us in February, and they will finish with us in December. And they are walking side by side our urban farm manager and experts that we're bringing in to teach classes that they attend every week. They spend about 15 to 20 hours with us. Um, and that has been fantastic. And we have learned a lot. And we see some things that we would like to do again. And we see things that we need to improve upon. Yeah. And that's been this process of this pilot year. Thank you. You're welcome. Lauren. So what, what does the process look like? Meaning what's the critical path to getting from, uh, from conversation or sale to actual uh, installation? Uh, conversation or sale? Me uh, meaning, meaning, okay, so I hear about this, uh -huh. right? So how do I get from hearing about it to actually growing the food? Right. What's that, sure. what does that look like? Okay. So um, remember, remember when Beth just said some things that we would change? So in our interview process, we want folks to, as we interview them, if they show interest, we want them to come and work out on the farm. Because farming is hard work, and there's no sugarcoating that. And so we don't want folks to get, become a part of the program that aren't prepared for what farming truly is, even city farming. And so having people come out, understanding that they are gonna be digging in the dirt, and there are gonna be days where they're gonna be on top of steaming piles of manure, and is this something that they really wanna invest in? Is this something that they wanna build a life with? And so we wanna give people the opportunity to work with us first, to see the work. Because when you hear, when people hear about farming and hear about, oh my gosh, I can grow it in the city, people get super excited. And then they're out on the farm and they're like, oh, this is a lot of work. And so that's what it, it's an application process. I go out and I recruit people that say, hey, I love farming. And then they come on board, visit us at the farm, work with us side by side, and then we go from there. All right, thank you, ladies. You're welcome. Thank you, Sequoia. Thank you, Beth. Don't forget about the snakes, too. <laughs> okay, so apparently I'm the only person that grew up on a farm or in the country. Oh, okay. Yes. Had to go pick tomatoes, onions, everything. So I know it's hard work, but it's great to have that fresh food. All right, we are down to our final finalist now. He is the last one up, and of course, the presentations have been great tonight, and we're going to continue that with our final and last finalist here, Diop Adisa with We Run This. All right, come on up, Diop. and I'm Social Entrepreneurship Director at the Keffer Institute. Um, okay, all right. <laughs> um, or maybe you need this one, how about this? Yes. Or they can turn it off now. We good? Okay. All right, sorry about that, a little technical difficulty. And all right, <laughs> I'm Dia Padisa. And I am the Director of Social Entrepreneurship at the Kepler Institute. So my job is to educate and empower young leaders to become social entrepreneurs. The Kepler Institute has created 10 social enterprises and worked to mentor over 50 young leaders in a predominantly African-American community in Indianapolis. Our latest social enterprise is We Run This. Our purpose is to end food deserts, and our mission is to create 300 community-powered food generators. 
In 2014, Indianapolis was ranked the worst food desert in the nation, according to the USDA. On a day in 2015, four local grocery stores that provided fresh produce to inner city neighborhoods all closed on the same day. That chain was called Double Eight Foods. Now just imagine that. It created a lot of angst, anxiety, and panic. A lot of residents didn't know where to get fresh produce and reliant on pantries and other peers to help them. So the Kepler Institute decided to lead youth-led conversations to allow community members to express their anxiety, but also to discuss what type of solutions could we implement to solve this problem. Out of those discussions, one of the main things we came to is that we needed to develop relationships with local growers in our community to access food. So basically, community members came together to address a particular need, that being the lack of access to produce, and decided that a program could be implemented to address that, hence the name, We Run This. So we provide bags of fresh produce, $20, with a retail value of $35. Each bag is roughly about 20 pounds and contains a variety of 10 produce items as well as eggs. You can pick up these bags monthly at our community center. And when you come, you'll smell cooking, you'll hear laughing and playing, because it's also primarily about building community. The people involved have been transformed because they can see that they can have the skills and the resources to empower themselves and tackle issues that they face every day. In our first year, we averaged about 35 customers monthly, and we, reached, and we recently increased that to 50. Our goal is to increase it to 150, as well as to provide produce twice a month as it relates to frequency. In 2003, I was a freshman at Bravo High School, and I was failing math class. And my father told me if I failed math class, I had to go to summer school. But I knew if I hid the report card, it would be too late to register for summer school. So I figured I had outsmarted my parents. And I did, until they decided that I needed to go with my father every day to a warehouse that he was running and do math homework. <laughs> my parents, especially my father, is a lifelong entrepreneur. A brilliant guy. He likes to read about quantum physics and leadership development. <laughs> And my mother is a quiet person. She likes to read about fantasy, spirituality, and romance. <laughs> so they decided to allow me to go to this warehouse and do homework with my father, starting with the first page and ending with the last page. My friends back home were wondering where I was at. So they asked me, hey, you're in this warehouse. Would your father let us come and do homework? So I, said, I asked my father, and he said yes. They came, they did schoolwork, as well as work readiness and entrepreneurial skills. When the school year returned and we still struggled, they decided to formalize the program. And that's how the Kepler Institute was born. It was, it was birthed in order to provide work readiness, public speaking, critical thinking, and social entrepreneurship skills to us as well as other African American males in the Indianapolis community. So I'm a product of that model. And I use those skills in a variety of ways in my life, whether that be in my art. I'm a hip hop artist. So I use my social entrepreneurial skills to develop intentional relationships, marketing, as well as promotion. And I think one of the main things that I got from it is that if I am able to continually empower myself, then I can address any issue I face. And I can also pass that on to other young people that I come across. So, we run this. The purpose, to end food deserts. The mission, to create 300 community-powered food generators. My name is Diapadisa. I'm with the Kepler Institute, and thank you for your time. Oh, all right. Do we have any questions, comments? Vanessa? Yeah, can you tell us a little bit more about like, what exactly do you mean when you say community-powered food generator and kind of you talked about the retail value of the food and 
kind of where is it sourced from? Like, how are you guys generating either revenue or sourcing grants? Got you. All right. So the term community power food generator, all right, it has two basic focuses. One is to generate food for community. And what we mean by that is that we would like to create relationships with local farmers. So all of the food that we provide is sourced locally. We go out and we develop relationships with people that grow food, and we provide that back to community. But when we say community power food generators, it's also about generating community. So by having people come together and discuss and dialogue how to solve the problem, a lot of members in the community had never met themselves before. So that's one aspect. Then when you come in, you hear, you hear people talking, you get to eat food, and food is critical to building community. Everybody likes to eat. So if you can provide that in a way where it bridges diversity and it bridges community, you can generate community as well as address the issues you find. In this particular instance, that is food. Um, and you asked me about sort of revenue, like how are you guys paying for this right now or how are you going to continue paying for the future? So one of the unique things about our model is we are an anti-deficit model. And that basically means we want to start with what we have, not what we don't have. So when these conversations started, one of the main things we looked at is what relationships do we have in the community who are willing to buy shares, right? That's just that, it's that simple. And after we start to take those numbers, all right, we have 10 people who buy shares, then that's X amount of dollars. And each share is $20, right? So then that gives us a price on how, that gives us a number on in terms of how much food we can go and buy each month from the local growers. And that's just the simple way. That way it removes the need for a heavy front end investment, right? And then it provides an incentive for community to understand that this is within their power to do. So that's the, that's the skinny of it. Thank you for your time. Thank you. If we, oh, you can stay up. Yeah, if we can have all of our wonderful innovators, please come to the stage. They have done an excellent job this evening. Please come so that we can applaud you all for just coming up with some of these wonderful, innovative ideas. Very, very nicely done. Truly nicely done. All right, this is our future, and we're going to be giving away cash prizes. We have the first, second, and third place prizes. They're going to get money tonight. Judges, you are dismissed right now because you are going to have a very hard time <laughs> trying to get a first, second, and third place winner. Um, we're also going to have dessert served, so please, if you need to take a restroom break, get to know someone else that you haven't met, get to talk to some of these innovators that are on the stage here, if you would like, but we certainly want to give them, once again, a round of applause for a great, great job. Thank you very much, thank you. All right, so we're gonna take about a five, 10 minute break, and we're gonna call you back once the judges are back in. Thank you all, thank you. Please, you dig.
All right, ladies and gentlemen, if you can find your seats, we're getting ready to give out some money. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Giving out some money. If everyone can please find your seats, we're going to get started again. All right, if we can have all of our storytellers to so please come on stage in the order that you were called before. And again, let's give them a round of applause. We've got everybody in their order. Are they in their order? You're in your order? Okay, I need you in your order, please. Yes. <laughs> One. Yeah. There you go. They're innovators and they're smart. All right. All right, so we have the checks. We have the money. 30000 for first place, second place, twenty. dollars and third place, $10,000 to give out tonight. It has truly been a pleasure being here. Thank you to everyone uh, for coming out. Let me do these thank yous because I know there's going to be lots of tears and happiness in a little bit. Uh, the American Heart Association's Mid-Atlantic Affiliate for providing the prize money. So thank you all very much and for leading this summit. We certainly appreciate it. Let's give them a round of applause. All right. Here we go. Our third place winner. Yes, I know, careful. No more, I won't go anymore. Our third place winner, who is going to take home $10,000 for their initiative. My daddy's namesake, Cecil, with the Gophers. Smile, Cecil. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, no, stand right there. Stand right there. Our second place winner, who's going to take home $20,000 tonight. Our main database. Maria. Maria. We need you up here, Maria. Do you need to take a picture with Maria or you want to wait till a little later? Okay. And the person who is going to take home thirty thousand dollars tonight as a storyteller with the empowered to serve is going to get us all in shape because we're going to be doing 5k's and so with the gospel run is our first place winner Uh, Y'all let her get her check, please. <laughs> I'm going to step off so that all of you can. Thank you so much to all of our finalists tonight, our storytellers. Thank you. We have some wonderful gifts for you all. Thank you very much for participating. Let's give our big winners a round of applause once again.
Ladies and gentlemen, our storytellers, our big winners tonight. Thank you so very, very much. Thank you all for coming out tonight. We certainly appreciate everything. Any final words? Huh? Oh, can we have you guys come this way, exit this way, our winners? Thank you so much. I'm Tamara G from the Michael Bazer Show, and we'll see you next time. Can you get all the contest winners back, all the contests. Oh. You didn't get them? Okay, they, oh, we need to see if we can get all the storytellers back on stage for one final photo with the winners. All the storytellers, if you're still here, I wish you had told me that two minutes ago. <laughs> the storytellers who are still here, and also the judges. Judges, if we can get you all to take a photo as well in the front. We need our winners. Storytellers on stage, storytellers on stage, please. If we can get our uh, storytellers, any that are still left. <laughs> storytellers, we need you up on stage one last time, please, with the judges. Judges, you did an excellent job. Thank you.